All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to call this afternoon's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs, to order. This afternoon, we focus on a new collection edited by Christopher McKnight Nichols and David Milne, entitled Ideology in U.S. Foreign Relations, New Histories, published in August by Columbia University Press. Joining us this afternoon is one of the authors, Christopher Nichols, and a three-person panel with Mary Dudzak, Michaela Unica Moore, and Penny Von Eschen. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my longtime colleague and fellow co-chair, Christopher Osterman, Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Center. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative, nonpartisan venture of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association. For over the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly in pre-COVID times in person at the Wilson Center, and since the pandemic and apparently post-pandemic era here in the virtual realm. And if you have your calendars out, please take note. Next Monday, the Washington History Seminar features Philippa Strum's new book, On Account of Sex, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the Making of Gender Equality Law, which is being, co which is being sponsored by the American Historical Association. Behind the scenes are two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the AHA. On the logistics front, please note, folks, Today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those of you with questions to use the raise hand function or the Q&A function on Zoom. If you use raise hand, we can call on you and you get to pose the question yourself. If you use Q&A, I get to pose the question for you. And with those preliminaries out of the way, I will turn over the session to our moderator, Christian Osterman, who will introduce our speakers. Christian, welcome, all yours. Thanks, Eric. Um, I'm delighted to introduce um, our speakers today. I'll introduce them uh, in turn. We'll start with Professor Christopher McKnight Nichols, Professor of History <clears throat> and Wayne Woodrow, Wayne Woodrow Hayes Chair in National Security Studies at the Mershman Center for International Security Studies at the Ohio, University, Ohio State University. And Andrew Carnegie Fellow, Organization of American Historians, Distinguished Lecturer and Award-Winning Teacher and Scholar. Nichols is the author of, or editor of six books. He is most well known for Promise and Peril, America at the Dawn of the Global Age. And most recently has published Rethinking American Grand Strategy. We featured that book um, last year in the Washington History Seminar lineup and Ideology and Foreign Relations what the book we'll be talking about today. A frequent public commentator on historical dimensions of US foreign and domestic policy and politics, Nichols specializes in the history of the United States and its relationship to the rest of the world, particularly in the areas of isolationism, internationalism, and globalization. Ideology in US foreign relations, new histories, is the recipient of the 2023 Joseph Fletcher Prize for Best Edited Book in Historical International Relations given by the International Studies Association. Chris, to you and your contributors, uh, a, a warmest congratulations and uh, a warm welcome to the Washington, or welcome back to the Washington History Seminar. Zoom room is all yours. Great. Um, thank you so much, Christian. And thank you, Eric, uh, for these kind uh, introductions and for this great invitation to be here with you all. It's really an honor to be with the Washington History Seminar Group uh, at the Wilson Center. Um, and thanks also to the team, uh, Peter and Rachel and everyone who helped pull this off. Um, special thanks uh, to uh, Michaela Honiki moore um, and Penny Von Eschen, who are authors in the book uh, and should be uh, uh, attributed as such, uh, written superb, insightful contributions, which we'll hear more about, um, and to Mary Dujak, uh, who will be kindly commenting. Um, not with us today, unfortunately, is my co-editor, David Milne, who's a fantastic scholar, and we're sort of dividing and conquering these events, but I just wanted to give him a shout out as well. He's been an amazing collaborator on this project. Um, in preparing for today, um, I have a number of comments to make um, to overview the book, uh, give a sense of some of the contributions, uh, and then hand it off to my great um, collaborators and contributors. Uh, but first, I'd be remiss not to say something about uh, what just happened at the University of Virginia and, and in Charlottesville, I think. Um, it was my graduate alma mater, uh, 
a place I care deeply about, uh, where Penny currently teaches, I'm hoping to visit in the coming year. Um, yet another school shooting is a reminder to me of some of the ways in which um, broader ideologies, policies, actions, and, and subtle, often uninterrogated experiences and expectations come together. Um, that you know, many in this audience are probably mourning this and thinking about this, and we probably also all remember when school shootings were um, more rare, and more tragic, more phenomenal. Um, that when the coverage was uh, more long lasting and calls for policy action uh, were fundamentally different than they are today. Uh, we've all become somewhat inured to these kinds of um, actions, these mass casualty, mass violence shootings. Um, and just in thinking about how they've become normalized, it's an opportunity to think a little bit about ideology, actually, uh, to think a little bit about the ways in which our experiences and our expectations are set by our lived experience itself, and then how that can have subtle ways of shaping how we think about possible futures, right, in thought, in policy, in life, and in death. Um, and so I just, you know, my heart goes out to Charlottesville and UVA, who suffered a lot in the last few years. But also, I think it's a way of, of focusing on one really tragic moment to consider the ways in which these sorts of moments can become normalized and they can set expectations for what might happen in the future. Uh, you know, and so I promise I'll be a little bit more uplifting from here, but I just wanted to say that to start out. Um, so as David Mill and I assert in our introduction, ideologies set the terms of engagement. Um, they shape politics, they're not static. Uh, they really order and explain the world that we live in and they project a kind of illusion of controllable outcomes, right? Ideologies often make us think that we can have more of a capacity to shape what is to come than perhaps is really reasonable to expect or historical um, evidence might suggest that we're somewhat mistaken about that. Uh, so they often serve to define success and failure, justify and set boundaries. They compel sacrifice, right? They're one of the reasons that people are willing to die uh, for their nation or for various causes, right? They, they can compel aggression uh, and they can justify inaction as well. Um, sometimes um, the, their very function hides the fact that they are ideologies. And that's another thing that's worth thinking about. And maybe we can discuss a bit as well. Um, and so we think, you know, what's an example of this? We can think, need think no further back than the Barack Obama presidential campaign of 2008, when he and his team elevated or aimed to elevate, quote, pragmatism over ideology. This is something we lay out in the introduction a little bit. It sort of needs no explanation, but just to, to you know, sort of think briefly about that. The U.S. historical record makes amply clear that policymakers and citizens alike um, have often wielded or operated out of ideological frameworks, even as they've eschewed them or disavowed them. Um, and uh, that's a pretty common um, element that we see in the historical record for policymakers and citizens. And a kind of pejorative cast ideology is something that the theoreticians have often also described as well. Um, it's, for me, particularly fascinating um, in the U.S. historical record as a nation that was forged out of an ideological project, right? This, this effort to cast aside monarchy, to, sh to reshape the structures of society, uh, coming out of kind of an, an enlightenment set of principles, among others, um, and yet the, it's a nation that's peculiarly often um, absent in its self-interrogation about ideas of ideology and the individuals within it. Um, now, I could go on a little bit more with that, and, uh, and, but let's just quickly unpack for a second gesture to the longer framework of ideology for the audience. All right. So the term ideology has a long and contested history. I can't do justice to it here, but I just wanted to say a few things at the outset um, to start our conversation. You know, it goes back roughly to the ideologue to the French Revolution, and they constructed it or really thought about it as a science of thought aimed at constructing a system of ideas that reflected material reality. And the big question for those who've thought about ideology ever since is how much do ideologies reflect material reality? Or are they in some other way, shape or form, uh, as, the, as about 50 years later after the French ideologues came on the scene, Karl Marx wrote that ideology was really much, uh, really importantly about um, not fundamentally uh, the, the material, um, but the relationship between culture, political economy, providing a kind of essential mechanism by which societies manage and reproduce themselves um, as he put it, society's legal, political, religious, aesthetic, and philosophic forms ensured that members of different classes viewed their positions in the social system and the system itself as natural. Um, so part of this is about fundamentally uh, Marx's view of um, ideology as a kind of about falsity and obfuscation, um, a, sort of a mask. Uh, 
Uh, but, you know, so in short, really, Marxist views of ideology focus on the ways in which they serve as a cover for exploitative economic systems. Now, in the 20th century, French Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser um, shifted that perspective a bit. And you see this more in the volume itself, how the historians in the volume tend to, to talk about ideology. Um, uh, and Althusser made the case that it's better understood as world making through reason and language, more of an imaginary set of relationships that do, in fact, do some work in corresponding in many ways to real conditions of, of lived existence. Uh, for him, he put it, uh, human societies, quote, excrete ideology as the very element and atmosphere indispensable to their historical respiration and life. And that sort of the sort of metaphors of the corpus and ideology go hand in hand um, in thinking about societies uh, and ideology for also Sir. So the ideology performs this social function of masking the structures of power, but actually having some real resemblance to the system itself, the lived relation to the real, as he put it. Now, I don't want to go on and on with definitions and bore you all too much, uh, but I just wanted to lay some of that out there um, to give a sense of what we're talking about when we when we go through this in this project. And, and the key to thinking about this and one of the one of the jumping off points for this volume was a brilliant book by Michael Hunt in 1987, Ideology in U.S. Foreign Policy. Lots of us here have probably read this or are aware of it. And he defines ideology along similar lines to the ways that many of us in the conference that helped give rise to the book do. Uh, roughly as follows, a quote, interrelated set of convictions or assumptions that reduces the complexities of a particular slice of reality to easily comprehensible terms and suggests appropriate ways of dealing with that reality. In other words, ideologies are about a set of assumptions and principles that help us organize the sort of infinitely complex in the world to something finite enough to order uh, our orientation to that world, to help us decide on policies and options moving forward. Um, as, as my colleague, co-editor David Milne likes to say, um, other writers suggested that the cerebral and primal become one of one where ideology is concerned. And what he likes to quote is Theodore Adorno, who once wrote, if the lion had a consciousness, his rage at the antelope uh, that he wants to eat would be his ideology. Um, now, perhaps we can return to talk about some of that um, as we go. But in any case, Hunt's purpose in, a, in ideology and U.S. foreign policy was to demonstrate how three varieties um, of ideology uh, really shaped U.S. foreign relations. They shaped elite policymaking. One was a conception of national mission. Um, the so second uh, was uh, the imposition of racial hierarchies, particularly on other peoples, but rare, racial hierarchical thinking in general. And the third was a deep set hostility towards social revolutions. And we see all of those um, in our volume, for sure. Um, but when David and I set out to, to do this project, um, and when the contributors began their conversations about the project, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do um, was to uh, broaden this uh, the sort of frameworks for this, the voices, the actors, the lenses of analysis, uh, far beyond elite policymakers um, and sort of top down uh, orientations of, of how to look at this. Uh, and, and one of the other things that we thought was that um, there was no way to do that project as in a single authored or, or dual authored book, that we really needed to rely on a large number of superb scholars who understood their archives and their eras and could contribute, you know, particular contributions from uh, different different perspectives, different periods um, to help, you know, uh, on the one hand, complicate a narrative of ideology in U.S. foreign relations and in another, really clarify it. So the result is 22 chapters in this book. Um, I think it's so much the better for the widespread uh, breadth and depth that the different contributors brought to, to bear. Um, the book is organized into five sections. So I'll, I'll give you a bit of that framework and then talk you a little bit through contributions and I'll sign off and hand over to people to dive into the meat of the book. But it's organized into roughly five sections that tackle um, ideologies of the people, ideologies of power, ideologies of the international, um, ideologies of democracy, and ideologies of progress. And they, it moves in that order. Some of the chapters could have been um, rearranged into different places. They fit across them. Um, but besides the contributions that we'll hear from our two contributors today, um, I thought I'd single out a few pieces of the book, just very briefly to mention, um, that give you a, a quite a different perspective than the one you might have gotten in Hunt's brilliant book. 
So Emily Conroy Crutz, writing on 19th century mission magazines intended for children. Uh, she talks a lot about and helps us to think about the generational dimensions of ideology, the world shaping that happens far before we're cognizant adults, right? That's a fascinating dimension to think about because the children of missionaries in the late 19th century, many of them had the cultural competencies and language skills to then become the diplomats of the 20th, 20th century, right? Um, they literally gave rise to the people who shaped the American century. Um, then we have chapters from Ima Bong Morin interrogating the foreign policy ideology of Eugenia Charles and Dominica in the 1980s, trying to orient a unilateralist U.S. foreign policy to Dominica's uh, own ends. Uh, Matthew Kruer with a really brilliant chapter on indigenous subjectivity in the period before the American Revolution, uh, what sorts of structures meant um, uh, equalized power actually across peoples and groups in colonial uh, America, and then how were those leveraged in different ways um, uh, over time. Uh, and then another chapter that I want to signal out, um, single out is Daniel Immerwar's chapter exploring how the cinematic universe of George Lucas was shaped by his aversion to modernization theory, uh, and th that has thinking about uh, sort of Star Wars as an antidote to Vietnam um, is a way to unpack and understand what Lucas was attempting to do in that moment. Now, there's a lot there, and it's a rich uh, and eclectic volume. We're really pleased with how it turned out. Um, so I'll give you a little bit more uh, shaping and then turn it over. You know, at the outset of, the, of working on this, we asked our authors a few questions that I think might help inform our conversation today, um, and the audience may be interested in these. Um, so what approaches most accurately reveal the influence and impact of ideologies? Uh, what about the conception, transmission, and reception of ideologies? Um, we also ask questions about premise and, and definition, sort of what counts as an ideology and does it matter? Um, must something function coherently uh, as an ideology to function ideologically? Uh, and this is something I argue in my chapter on unilateralism, that the U.S.'s unilateralist impulses from the revolutionary era to the present actually don't need to be an ideology to function ideologically. You can think about recent presidencies if you want to consider that, or you can go pretty far back and think about the Washingtonian and Jeffersonian injunctions against entangling alliances um, to, to consider some of these sorts of orientations. Um, finally, um, for our purposes here uh, in this conversation, um, a few of the major themes that developed from the conference that I wanted to just toss out there uh, are really um, at work across the chapters in the book. Uh, you see a central ideological struggle over competing visions of democracy and democracy's play place in the long arc of civilizations, um, variously defined and vigorously contested. Uh, you, you see these sorts of battles uh, among um, capitalism, morality, democracy, and liberalism in a U.S. Civiliza civilizing mission, uh, a project uh, as mission and an organizing worldview, sort of U.S. mission worldview, um, again, often hotly debated, in which inequality and racism were clearly shot through in central contests uh, from before actually the revolution. And so, you know, in this way, we're adding a, a bottom uh, up and a top down sense of understanding this to some of what Hunt's previous work did. Another piece here, just to note um, in passing, is exceptionalism. We see we saw exceptionalism um, throughout many of the chapters. Uh, but sometimes as a synonym for empire and in other times as a way of contesting things like empire um, or aggression or intervention. Uh, so, um, you know, one piece of that puzzle is that we saw that link to key terms over time. And I think one thing that um, Jeremy Surrey has emphasized in talking about this book is that you see in this moment historians looking at this topic of ideology uh, very much on a kind of linguistic and cultural turn. Uh, we're very attentive to language and rhetoric um, in ways that uh, that Hunt wasn't so much in that era. Uh, and so, you know, if, if you're tracing this arc, the one I just depicted on these contests, um, central ideological contests over competing visions of democracy, you might track them from the city on the hill in the colonial era to manifest destiny and settler colonialism to the arsenal of democracy in World War II, um, to the sort of indispensable nation that, that has informed the sort of Cold War into the post-Cold War period. Um, now, I, I could go on about this, uh, but I wanted to give uh, some of these, these big picture findings so that we could uh, engage them in the discussion. And I will leave that, at, and I'm very eager to hear uh, from my co-panelists. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, it's now really a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Michaela Henneke Moore, who earned her PhD in 1998 from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, 
She is an associate professor of history at the University of Iowa, author of the prize-winning Know Your Enemy, the American Debate on Nazism, 1933 to 1945, and contributing editor um, of The Uncertain Superpower, Domestic Dimensions of U.S. Foreign Policy After the Cold War. She most recently wrote about Foreign Policy Begins at Home, Americans and Grand Strategy in World War II, part of the Rethinking Grand Strategy uh, volume, as well as, well as um, already mentioned, contributed chapter uh, to this book um, uh, containing the multitudes, nationalism, and U.S. foreign policy ideas at the grassroots level. Her current project is a study of the varieties of American patriotism. Americans debate their country's role in the world from the Good War to Vietnam, a project sponsored by an NEH fellowship. Michaela, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Floor, the Zoom room is yours. Thank you, Christian. So I join all of you from a place of deep gratitude. First of all, to David Milney and to Chris for having invited me. This was just such a fantastic opportunity, the conference and this volume and this meeting. And deep uh, thanks also to the Wilson Center and to the AHA and, and, and all these wonderful souls behind the scenes making this um making this happen. So as Chris said, um, 35 years ago, Michael Hunt put ideology on the map of US foreign policy. And it's just worth remembering, some of us are old enough to remember it, that it didn't really exist for US diplomatic historians with regard to their own nation's official policy. You know, there were studies about the ideology and the Chinese communist regime and, you know, the Russians, of course, you know, communism and so on. His definition of ideology, which Chris just um, read out, which was very helpful, um, was capacious and is rightly critiqued um, and refined by the authors to this volume. Um, the advantage of a somewhat loose and capacious um, encompassing definition, basically he defines uh, ideology the way many of us would um, use the term worldview, um, allows the rest of us to shine our uh, specific spotlights on whatever we care most about. So I think that is uh, an advantage because um, everyone has a belief system, you know, including scholars and historians and pundits and so on. So I just want to briefly uh, remind the audience of the three uh, sort of pillars, constitutive elements in Hans, um, really description, I mean, analysis, but then description, he weaves this through 250 years of, you know, US history, um, constitutive elements of US foreign policy ideology. So there is first, as Chris already mentioned, a nationalism that deemed uh, territorial expansion and then an overseas empire, military interventions culminating in hegemony as an essential, as a required um, element for domestic especially economic uh, well-being, and in its official justifications, uh, the civilizing mission um, casts this as beneficial. You know, this empire is beneficial for others, sort of the empire for liberty. I think this is important to note because immediately we recognize it's not different from the European empires and even the European post-colonial nations, you know, uh, through this very day. So it's another take on the theme that U.S. exceptionalism and universalist claims um, are actually the most widely shared of between other, among other nationalists uh, and other nations' um, ideologies as well. The second, as Chris said, is um, the pillar of white supremacy. And as he shows in his history of US foreign policy, um, it's often rooted in white Christian um, beliefs. And even we could narrow it a little bit further down Protestant, although, you know, the Catholics get their say as well in due time. Um, and he calls it racial hierarchies, as Chris said. And the third element is a sanctified notion of private property and an unwavering faith in capitalism, which leads, um, as Chris said, first to sort of an ambivalence about other people's uh, revolutions, you know, um, through the 19th century and into the early 20th century. But by the 20th century, it more and more hardens in outright hostility. Um, against revolutions, even reforms, that um, are aiming for radical, transformative socioeconomic change and hostility and aversion against people who advocate um, and support it, whether at home or uh, abroad. So in that regard, 
um, several authors, but I'll, I'll point out uh, Penny because I want to return to Penny's uh, essay in a moment. Um, she calls that, you know, substituting, equating, uh, confusing capitalism with democracy uh, or freedom with free market. I mean, it's something that we all know, but I think it, it's worth um, highlighting again. So you can see how these beliefs uh, and preferences and practices that uh, Hunt also outlines essentially reflect and are anchored in our domestic, political, economic, social, uh, and racial order and institutions, and from here get projected outward and shape uh, foreign policy. And this is also where the famous normalizing and naturalizing work of ideologies uh, is done. This has to be taught uh, in schools, in churches, it has to be promoted by politicians. Today, we would say from both parties, but let's remember we once even had four parties in this country, maybe even more. So it has to be promoted across the political spectrum um, and in the media and by experts and believed and embraced by ordinary people. Otherwise, it doesn't work as a directive, sort of functional uh, foreign policy ideology. So periodically in our history, however, uh, there has been so with this, I wanted to say deeply rooted, widely spread. But however, um, periodically in our history, um, there has been a real reckoning with this ideology or with elements uh, of it. And our current, current period is such a moment, but you know, not, not the first and by no means the most important one, where the seemingly widely embraced understanding of, let's call it the US role uh, in the world is questioned and rejected. Um, from all conceivable angles, religiously, politically, ideologically, um, and on all levels, grassroots, experts, and, uh, and politicians. And I think that what, especially maybe for the current moment, but at other times as well, what prompts it, I think, is the shock about our inability to learn from history. So this is reminiscent of Einstein's, you know, famous definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for different uh, results. But I prefer a different quote from Einstein um, that goes like this. Problems cannot be solved with the same mindset that created it. In the chapter, uh, in my chapter to the spoken in my larger uh, scholarly project, I focus on voices on the grassroots level, as Christian just mentioned, and then paying, which is primarily uh, white voices. And I capture them through letters to the president, to other elected officials, senators, congresspeople, but others as well, letters to the editor, private correspondences, oral histories, um, and, um, um, and, and also a lot has been actually written about my topic by historians and, and adjacent fields. So I'm, I'm drawing on that as well. Um, so I look at grassroots level with these letters, which sort of foregrounds a little bit white people. And then I pay special attention through specialized collections to African-American experiences and critiques of US foreign policy and to soldiers and veterans reflecting on their war experience as sort of the implementation end often of US foreign policy, as well as three select groups of refugees who turned US citizens from World War II, from the Korean police action, and from the war in Vietnam. And my main takeaway is that fortunately there's ample of evidence um, in, the, in the sort of archival record out there uh, that there are alternative, there are other mindsets at play to link this back to Einstein. Um, so we're not completely locked into that iron cage, although of national security doctrines, although it often feels that way. So there are alternative mindsets at play in our public sphere if we're only willing to sort of tune in. Uh, in other words, there is a continuous patriotic um, practice um, there is a continuous practice of patriotic cons, uh, dissent. And um, I choose that word wisely and I can be, I invite questions on it for later. A continuous practice of patriotic dissent and contestation um, and a deep reservoir of alternative uh, forms of international engagement, preferences for alternative forms of uh, international engagement, and uh, a whole set of different lessons learned from history and from experience. That is, 
available, that is out there, that is clearly articulated throughout our history as well. So the picture that emerges from my research, um, which also draws on the published scholarship of others, is the one that our colleague Jeremy Suri, who has a, an important chapter in this book, um, sketches out in an important piece um, that was published today by the New York Times, in which he basically argues, let's stop chasing an elusive consensus. And to that, I would add, and let's also pay attention to the voices that don't fit into hegemonic discourses. Um, so Jeremy says, that is simply not what this country ever has been about, the vital center, the consensus. It has always been full of strife. It has always been full of hardcore political conflict and contrarian positions all the way into you know, the Civil War. I'll conclude with a quick remark on the parallels that so struck me um, between Penny Farnesians and my contributions. So it starts with her wonderful title, Roads Not Taken. The post-Cold War alternative visions of international leaders from Mikhail Gorbachev to Václav Havel to Nelson Mandela deeply resonate with my findings for the post-World War II, the early Cold War period. So what the two have in common is their post-war right, uh, periods. In our conventional narrative, I think we have completely lost sight, uh, not so much the historians, but sort of more the way we in public talk about our history. We have lost sight of how deeply a majority, that I can only prove through public opinion polls, how a majority of Americans at the grassroots level longed for, and here comes a quote, a new world order based on multilateral cooperation and demilitarization. And the quote is from Penny's essay, and I have verbatim the same in a, in a separate article that I just published because it's in my sources from the 1940s. And these things need some unpacking, especially in the context of uh, my sort of domestic views, multilateralism and demilitarization, but we can come to that later. Um, also in that context, uh, what shines through uh, in my sources very clearly is a different take on America first. So this is something that my people in the 40s are not using as a term because they are very um, conscious of Charles Lindbergh uh, definition of that. And, and we are of course of you know, um, Trump, but um, I have started in my own internal dialogue to use that word America first because it shows up in letter after letter after letter regardless from which political perspective in that post-World War II period, let's stay at home now. Let's improve things at home. Let's make a better America democracy. Let's start implementing political and civil rights for Americans before we go abroad in search of monsters to destroy or you know, spread our, spread our goodies. Um, also in that context, these are not just alternative visions, um, but a whole set of alternative lessons learned. I think that's important, you know, not just visions, but lessons learned from experience, um, from recent war experience. And on a side note, I just want to add, uh, I think I have to do that as uh, a European, the leaders or as a dual citizen, I want to clarify. Um, the leaders' visions um, would not have been possible without the People's Revolution of 1989 and the grassroots activism of Black South Africans, of course. So in our history, we have so few successful, peaceful political revolutions that if one comes along every 100 years, we should name it what it was. It was a people's revolution. It were people who sort of you know, brought this about. And um, finally, I want to just comment on uh, this very important aspect that Penny brings up in her chapter, the emphasis on embodiment. Humans are dependent on each other. Um, that's part of the human condition. That's universal, actually. Um, we are vulnerable. We are interdependent. We are subject to contingency and uncertainty. And I expand a little bit on this in my, in my chapter and in, in other writings, but basically I'm struck by how the largely white male professional um, political elite um, in formulating foreign policy 
uh, sometimes seems to miss that essential universal point, which realists and others are trying to bring home to them, but, you know, with limited success, and which is very alive and well and very beautifully articulated in my letters, you know, letters from the grassroots level. Because regular citizens, uh, I project, live a life full of reversals and uncertainty um, and contingencies and lack of control. So I can go on for the next hour, literally quoting from uh, my letters, um, I think both religiously and more sort of philosophically minded admonitions in writing to Truman, in writing to Atchison, in writing to LBJ, um, warning that we are not the rulers of the universe. The US is not the ruler of the universe. And also warning against uh, trying to control the course of history. We cannot shape the course of history. Uh, many protest that attempt as hubris because of um, because they are because they are religious. I think that just has to be acknowledged. You know, we we have this throughout this ideology book, throughout different chapters. You know, religion and religious beliefs really shape you know foreign policy ideology. And in the same context, um, the chapter by Andrew Preston is, is very relevant for my key point. He analyzes the sort of secure insecurity, fear, national security problem and tension. Um, as I write in my chapter, from the Bolshevists uh, to the civil rights movement, from the Catholics to the Muslims, from African Americans to Asian Americans, the very Americans, the very U.S. citizens that have been pathologized and associated with external threats were most liable to experience violence and insecurity at home. And we just have to like take that into the picture. Uh, and then partially overlapping with these groups that I just read out are U.S. combat soldiers uh, who experience um, sort of an existential threat. Uh, so this points to the real and often, I think, you know, very painful to consider gap between the assumptions of national security and the justification of such and such a war for national security reason and the experiences um, of U.S. citizens. So much more needs to be said, but not all by me. So I stop here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michaela, for these wonderful comments or actually uh, um, uh, thoughts and, and arguments. Um, we'll now turn to, I think, to Penny von Eschen, who will play off of some of uh, Michaela's points. Um, Dr. von Eschen is professor of history and the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of American Studies at the University of Virginia. She received her PhD from Columbia in 1994. Her latest book, Paradoxes of Nostalgia, Cold War Triumphalism and Global Disorder since 1989 was published by Duke University Press this year. She is also the author of Such Mobilos Up the World, Jazz Ambassadors Play the Cold War, published by Harvard in 2004, and Race Against Empire, Black Americans and Anti-Colonialism, 1937 to 1957, winner of the 1998 Stuart L. Bernhardt Book Prize. Recent essays include From London, 1948, to the Car, 1966, Crises in Anti-Colonial Counterpublics, published um, in an edited volume on Imagining the Third World, Genealog Genealogies of Alternative Global Histories, uh, published just this, this month, and Imperial Visions of the World, From Confident to Embattled Empire, published in Mark Bradley and David Engelmann and Melanie McAllister's uh, the Cambridge History of the uh, of America in the World, uh, published last year. Penny, it's wonderful to have you. Welcome to the Washington History Seminar. Zoom room is yours. Well, thank you so much. Um, so I, I want to sort of start a little bit more by winging it and riffing off these wonderful, wonderful comments and, um, and, and talk about commonalities and relationships with both of these um, wonderful essays that uh, Michaela and Chris did. And I think um, first, um, Michaela had mentioned, you know, I think we were both struck by some of the deep commonalities in our pieces. And Michaela's absolutely right. I mean, we both identified a period of um, 
a, a great contest of, um, of a whole variety of ways in which people around the world and Americans are looking at um, looking at the place of the U.S. in the world and looking at looking at various futures. And just to sing out a couple of things that I so appreciate in Michaela's incredible work, and everyone should go read it if they haven't, um, both that she really captures the multiple registers at which ideologies are being both, you know, created and always contested. That's the other thing that we share. These are never fixed. These are never, you know, set. Although at times certain ideologies do emerge as extremely powerful with um, with the power through, you know, violence and persuasion to set the, you know, set the terms on which other people are forced to act. But again, you get this really beautiful sense of these different multiple registers. And again, always always contested. Um, and I think um, one of the other, um, just kind of going to some commonalities with, with Chris, um, my particular essay, and, and Michaela is so kind in, study, in, in, in setting it up. And so it, it it's called Roads Not Taken, and it looks at at least what Michaela beautifully puts as the people's revolution. You get a synergy across the globe with the anti-apartheid movement, with Gorbachev, with Havel, with Berlin, and people all over the world are demanding um, a remaking of history. And what's very interesting to me is that in terms of thinking about ideology, um, and in the essay, I, I contrast that people's revolution with what I call kind of, you know, a will to totality that you see in a mixed, um, in, in a sort of an intersection of neoliberalism and unipolarity, where the U.S. says we're the sole U.S. power. But we'll come back to that. So I see a real contrast in this people's revolution um, because these democratic projects of the 80s and 90s, from Gorbachev's call for Glasnost to Eastern European dissidents and the anti-apartheid movement and other, like you think of the, the labor movements of, of Lula in Brazil and the, um, you know, the many other democratic um, anti-imperial global movements that, that intersect with these. These all contain self-conscious critiques of totalizing ideologies in both their state communist and capitalist imperialist forms. And to me, that's what makes them very, very powerful. So Gorbachev and others in the East are saying openness, glass-nosed. We must have political openness. We want a mixed market economy. But they're they're critiquing the um, stultifying, again, totalitarian or authoritarian ideologies that came in many forms in the communist bloc. Um, and but they're also they're not jumping in and saying, oh, my God, bring us a free market. We own neoliberalism. So they're asking for socialism with a human face. They're saying, you know, we need um, you know, we need to be flexible and we need markets, but they don't want to turn basic human needs over to the market like healthcare, like education. And they're also in this moment very concerned about the environment in political glass notes, let's let's look at the cost of the cold war and what both all blocks have done in in greatly militarizing destroying the environment and um so and all redressing all of this requires some economic distribution it requires um a, a lot of regulation and debilitation and again, demilitarization is is really key to that. Um, so, so again, just to underline that you know, again, there there's you know, they're not jumping into a celebration of an unregulated market, and um, or and and there's a very overt call for a more much more deeply cooperating world. We need to all cooperate to address environmental damage. We need to demilitarize. Havel comes to the United States and says, you know, um, we must get out of his words, the bipolar straitjacket. We must think in terms of a multipolar world. And um, but and both of these, um, yet these these visions, and again, the people side that Michaela so importantly emphasizes, if you look at um, broadly shared opinion, so many people in the United States want um, are, are calling for a peace dividend. 
you know, we don't need this money for militarism anymore. All this money can go to what's been neglected in the United States, which are social programs, healthcare, education, basic infrastructure, you know, it, roads, bridges crumbling. We need to reinvest in the common good. So like, so there is a cry to reinvest in the common good. And what, what I, and I may not be able to convince you of this now, but what I, what I argue in this piece and in a, the paradoxes book that this somewhat, re, you know, that this reflects the beginning of that book is that is very quickly displaced by a radical remilitarization that comes from um, gets congealed in the U.S. first the Gulf War in Iraq and then a radical demand for um, a, 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 de a deregulated market. And this also goes along with certainly, you know, we. it also goes along with a complete recommitment to the um, the carbon economy of oil, of gas, and, 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 and a rejection of climate change, which also involves a rejection um, of science because it, it, it entails a rejection of um, a broad scientific community that is calling that, you know, that's calling for a rejection of the fossil fuel industries and looking at the damage to the environment. So again, this all, you know, this kind of looks at, um, so sort of why, why could that, you know, why did that happen so quickly? And what I would emphasize here, I really emphasize the contest. I don't think it's that everybody went along with these people, but it, it involved a rearticulation of unipolarity and a rearticulation of forms of American exceptionalism. And I'd love to have this conversation with Chris. I, I in 100% agreement with Chris's essay says, unipolarity is one of the founding sustained ideologies of American. It starts with the revolution. You know, we, we're gonna, we can do what we want. We're gonna do our own thing, get out of our way. And I completely agree with that. And I, but what I'm curious about here is that a lot of people would say, maybe say that you're also talking about American exceptionalism and the word unipolarity, the idea of unipolarity emerges at moments, gets articulated to American exceptionalism. And the reason I'm, and, and I sort of see this as a rearticulation in this moment because people weren't talking about unipolarity before. They were talking because the U U.S. had to have its allies. You know, they were, you know, it was the Western Bloc and everybody was working together around both a, a, a political economy. But, but in no uncertain terms, you know, by the 90s, Bush is saying, we are the world's sole superpower. We are the one and you will kind of do what we say. So I'm just curious as to how Chris sees that rearticulation and the reemergence of unipolarity. And the last thing I'll say is, um, and I, I will be quick about this and jumping just into, and again, you know, something Michaela said is that, um, I, I I talk in the essay, and I'm not going to try to you know completely take this apart now about about like some some worldviews being having having being more false than others, and some having a commitment to sort of a will to totality. And I think I I think of the neoliberalism, a libertarian that this libertarian version of the world is particularly pernicious because it does deny human society. It denies human connection. And, and in practical terms, um, and you you really, if you go and look at the 1992, um, I know they didn't win, but look at the Republican platform, they're viciously going after any form of government, equating education and healthcare with communism. So any form of human organizing that's not, as Thatcher puts it, just the individual, in Margaret Thatcher, there is no such thing as society. Any form of organizing beyond that unit becomes corrupt, bureaucratic, Kremlin communism. And they're using that language in that moment. And, um, and so this is a, this is a, just a, um, a pernicious denial of the fact that we are so fundamentally interconnected. How can you get somebody sprung from the head of Zeus when humans are would die if they didn't have, you know, they weren't taken care of for years and years on end. And um, we are deeply connected on one another, as well as other, you know, living beings in the earth, completely kind of deep, um, you know, again, inter interspecies interconnections that are interdependence. And so, and so I really emphasize the violence in denying that. And I just back to Chris's point, and I'm 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 glad you brought that up. I I didn't I was afraid, you know, it's the 
the when we I, when I'm uh, back to just kind of the violence today in the city that I'm working and um, to several of the students that were killed are like I've I've had we've had students in these classes. They're clustered around American studies and African American studies and the work that I do. Um, and this this both this this absolute um, libertarianism that says no regulation, anybody can, anybody can have a gun while. And the pandemic so shows us we have broken our education and our, our public schools and our 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 health systems and our mental health systems to, to such an enormous degree under this you know ideology of no government. And I think what we see on the ground is just enormous suffering and enormous brokenness. And um both, you know, the, the pandemic demonstrated so clearly um, you know, in the midst of um again, a further withdrawal from, you know, as, as Trump's withdrawing from climate agreements and withdrawing from the World Health Organization, how badly this, this ideology of um, not just unipolarity, but of just this, this denial of human dependence it, it, it is just how badly it's served, you know, it's not serving the world. It, it's, it's breaking the world and it, it's, it's, it, and, and it's breaking it at, a at a greatly accelerated pace. So that's, I'll, I'll end there. And, um, and again, and I should have said, thank you. This is a, such an exciting volume and it's just been such a pleasure. So I look forward to discussion. Thank you, um, Penny. Um, let me, before I introduce our commentator, um, uh, remind our audience that you can uh, join the conversation by using the raise hand function and you'll be queued and um, I'll uh, uh, ask you to speak and we'll call on you once I call you and uh, you, or you can use the Q&A function and the Zoom functionality and I'll be posting the question or comment um, to our um, panelists um, and feel free to uh, uh, join uh, the queue now. All right, well, there's a lot here on the table that our three editors slash authors have, have put on the table, um, uh, a, a, a huge subject. Um, and uh, when it comes to these really, really difficult and broad topics, we like to turn to um, uh, some Washington history seminar stalwarts. Uh, there's no other word for uh, Mary Dujak, um, who's been uh, joined us for a number of sessions. She, of course, is the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Law and currently the President's Humanities Fellows at the Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry at Emory University. She's a leading legal historian and a US and the world scholar. She's a past president uh, of the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations and an honorary fellow of the American Society for Legal History. Dujak earned her AB from the University of California, Berkeley, and her JD and PhD in American Studies from Yale University. Her books include Wartime, An Idea, Its History, Its Consequences, published by Oxford in 2012, and Cold War Civil Rights, Race and the Image of American Democracy, published by Princeton in the second edition in 2011, and most recently, Making the Forever War, Marilyn Young on the Culture and Politics of American Militarism, co-edited with Mark Bradley, published by the University of Massachusetts Press just last year, a volume we were also delighted to discuss in the Washington History Seminar. Mary, warm welcome back. The Zoom room is yours. Um, th thank you so much. I'm honored to be back here at the uh, Washington History Center <laughs> here being in my study uh, at my home in Atlanta, but that's what, what, what we do these days is it's really wonderful to, to see you and, um, and to the audience. Thank you for uh, for being with us. I'm mindful of the fact that uh, that you are entitled to have your say. So I will do my best to, to sort of make a couple of points and and ask a question um and and then and and save time for for you uh, so um the uh this book ideology in foreign relations by chris nichols and david milne is is really an extraordinary accomplishment it's not usual for 
collections of essays to get a big book prize, but they did. Um, and uh, w looking at the book, it's really um, not surprising it, at all that this happened. It's really this sort of wonderfully broad and capaci capacious examination of ideas relating to U.S. foreign relations. Um, it has completely what what from a traditional ideology in U.S. foreign policy or ideas in U.S. foreign policy standpoint, it has ideas that normally are just simply not brought to the table. So it's not just pennies, you know, roads not taken, which is so important and essential, um, but opening with the ideas of um, indigenous peoples um, and including young people um, and their ideas in, in the mix. Um, so I, I think the, the book is also beautifully constructed and written um, so that it is um, really uh, a, 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 a wonderful volume for anyone interested in ideas relating to U.S. foreign policy and U.S. foreign relations, uh, regardless of use, right? So, you know, I'm thinking um, holiday season is, is upon us. Uh, this is an easy uh, ex <laughs> surprise uh, 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 buy for you. Um, but what, a, what an amazing course book. Um, I expect this will have enduring an enduring impact across um, courses, and and I I bring this up, you know, for uh, the benefit of the audience. You know, if you're thinking about uh, whether you you might want to use it, I, I really encourage you to to look at it. One of the wonderful things about it is because it's so capacious in the voices present in the volume. It's not like there's a token a black a person who is, you know, mentioned in chapter. Really, there's sort of all the sort of richness of, you know, black ideas um, and, and uh, you know, ideas across social groups, um, ideas as they impact various um, kinds of populations. Um, and that will allow students to see themselves um, in U.S. foreign policy history. Uh, and that is really sort of a gift of this volume to, to sort of present U.S. foreign policy not as this closed elite circle, but as something that Americans across categories have always engaged in. So, uh, so thank you to Chris and David for doing this for us. And, and I really, um, encourage you to take a look at it as a as a course book so so just a, a couple of thoughts of, about the book um you know it's and and i'm sort of on some level i'm asking questions but when we're going to q a right so that um these are sort of questions that i'm sort of putting out into into the zoom room um not not sort of directly calling on chris to answer right now um but um the the title of the book ideology and uh, in uh, U.S. foreign relations, from my perspective, it actually could have also been called um, ideas in U.S. foreign relations or an intellectual or intellectual histories of U.S. foreign relations. So it's not working with the narrower de definition of ideology, right? So ideology only as certain operative strategic ideas, um, but rather a broad set of ideas relating to U.S. foreign relations um, and not just relating to elite movements in U.S. foreign relations, right? So, um, so it, it's really a capacious approach to thinking about ideas and the role of the U.S. Um, in a global space. Um, so, um, uh, my, my principal really sort of question about the book um, is um, how ideas um, relate to other things, um, right? Particularly, how do ideas relate to politics? Um, and um, it would be, you know, you could imagine thinking, well, um, uh, ideas about foreign policy intersect with ideas about politics, and so we're all in sort of an ideology or ideas soup. Um, but I, 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 in order to understand ideas about foreign policy as doing essentially work in history, 
Uh, it, this may be the, you know, the pesky causality question, but really, you know, when are ideas doing work in history? They, I t believe that they are, right? But my question is really exactly how do we know that? Um, and, and so times when, you know, uh, ideology is in there, but you, we might think of politics as doing the work, um, exist all over the place. So, so um, when um, when Senator Joseph McCarthy from Wisconsin held up, you know, in the Cold War and said, I have a list of 205 uh, communists in the State Department, you know, what was he doing? Um, he was trying to get reelected, right? He had concrete political interests at stake. And yeah, he was anti-communist, um, but his moves in that moment were for these concrete political self-interests that he had. And I think that we often see um, a concrete political interests that I would argue are sort of out, at least sort of not directly, you know, arising from. I mean, he would have been interested in getting reelected if it wasn't if there wasn't a cold war right if anti-communism wasn't the driving ideology um and, and so uh and so how do we know when it's the ideas that are doing the work and 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 not something else and i personally am not really satisfied with just a, it's the soup of ideas and you know and 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 uh, uh but and and i it, i think it's sort of interesting to think about because because one of the reasons it matters, and, and another example that 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 I think about a lot actually is um, is the the 2002 Senate campaign of Max Cleland, um, senator from Georgia. I didn't live in Georgia at the time, um, but he was uh, you know he was a multiple amputee um, Vietnam War vet, um, and uh, he uh, was basically red baited out of the Senate. Um, he actually voted in favor of the war in Iraq, which he felt he had to do, politically thought it was the, the worst vote of his life. Um, so there he's, you know, uh, uh, compromising ideology for the purpose of getting reelected. Um, but, but really the example I wanna bring up is the way that he was basically, the ads by Saxe B. Chambliss run against him morphed from his picture to that of Osama bin Laden. So his critiques and concerns about the directions of US foreign policy were used against him in a way that were widely have widely been thought to be just terribly unfair um, as a way of scaring the voters um, a, a, away from him. So, uh, so, you know, what was that about? Um, that was, you know, driven by a concrete effort to get <laughs> for Sachs B. Chambliss to get, you know, elected to the Senate. Um, it was driven by, you know, Republican Party interests in increasing their power um, on Capitol Hill. And I think that um, often ideologies are sort of used in the service of political um, and, and other sort of concrete interests. Um, and um, so there, I, I truly think that the causality isn't the ideology, right? The causality is those interests because if it wasn't the, the, the sort of um, the foreign policy ideology, it would have been something else. Um, and, and so how do we know that it's the foreign policy related ideas that are doing the work in history. Um, and how do we know when it's actually something else? Um, it's always interesting um, and sort of capacious and wonderful as the book shows. Um, but I think if, um, I mean, this would be, you know, again, not for Chris right now, but maybe as an example question, right? Um, I, 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 I do think it, the book leaves this it informs our understanding of this question, 
Um, but, um, but I think methodologically it leaves it a little open and that's not a bad thing about the book. Um, it's just, I think one of the things that's so, uh, wonderful about it. So I think I'll just close there. And, and again, um, thank you, Chris and, and David in absentia, uh, for sort of, uh, giving this, uh, really terrific book to the world. Um, and thank you to my co-panelists, um, who were, especially those who were part of it. Thanks, Mary. Um, Great comments. And actually, let me, uh, um, uh, before we open it up to the audience, uh, do give Chris a chance to respond to your questions and also, perhaps also reflect on a couple of points raised by um, uh, the other panelists. Uh, Chris? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, yeah, thanks so much for all of your great comments and thoughts there. And, you know, I think Mary, we could have that conversation for a long time. One of the purposes of the way we define ideology in the book is to leave it fairly open because I think the contributors actually don't fully agree on what that definition would be and on the sort of orientation that you're describing how far one should push the pesky causality question. Um, I'm remi I was reminded in your thinking there about um, Daniel Bell who argued roughly, and forgive the bad paraphrase, that Daniel Bell's definition of ideology um, is something like um, th that its latent capacity is to help illuminate or push emotion. And I think some of what you were describing about the choices made, whether to choose a domestic political sort of rhetoric and option, say racism, in the in the way that a commercial ad is is um, is meant to galvanize a particular kind of position for political ends, or a foreign policy one, right? So if choose a Willie Horton ad versus an Os Osama bin Laden ad, right? Tells you something about what they see as the most effective way of generating that emotion to drive the outcome that they want. And therefore, to my mind, the way I would line that up would be of the infinite set of possibilities, now paraphrasing Hunt, they chose the particular path of a set of foreign policy kind of ideas, images, or rhetorics uh, because they thought it would be effective, perhaps, because the individuals either believed it or at least um, understood it to be something that was uh, enough in transmission and circulation that it would work with an audience. Um, you know, there's a number of ways to push that forward. But I think you know, one of the things that the volume does that historians haven't been doing as much as, say, our colleagues in literary studies is we talk about emotion uh, a fair amount in the book. And I think that that's one way to think about ideology as generating that. Um, just to quickly uh, go to Penny's great question, you know, I'm very attentive in my chapter to unilateralism, but I think her point um, uh, about the way that unilateral impulses come up in moments of crisis, and we might even uh, bring up both uh, Michaela's uh, era right after World War II and Penny's era right after the end of the Cold War, um, you see this visceral orientation by American foreign policy elites to some extent, but very much from the grassroots. I think maybe just as much or more from the grassroots of a sense of saying there are limits to power, What's happening at the high levels of politics um, does not correspond to my sense of how the world operates or how I want it to. Uh, and then, the, you know, as U.S. power becomes more significant, it should be no surprise that a kind of unilateralism can morph into a kind of unipolarity. Um, and then that can dominate the discourse coming out of that era in the way that a sort of unilateralist impulse, you might argue, uh, was a big part of why the U.S. rejected the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations and, and orienting the US when it certainly wasn't the unipolar world, right? But a, a more unilateralist orientation to how to wield power. I could certainly elaborate that more, um, but I'm uh, happy to open this up to my colleagues and, and I see some good questions coming in. Great, thank you. Um, let's, uh, let me remind uh, our audience, the time is now to pose your question in the Q&A or by the raise hand function. Uh, let's first go to Stephen Shore. Uh, yes, uh, my question, I have two brief related questions. The first is, I get somewhat impatient when I hear about the lessons of history. Would it not be more accurate to speak of the lessons of the historians who write history? And if so, how aggressively should these historians um state what they believe are the alleged lessons of history. If they say there are no lessons to be learned, it probably would not help their uh, their their book sales. And if they say two if they have two specific lessons, are they not crossing the border into ideology? Would like to take that on. I see Michaela. <laughs> 
Christian, may I? Sure, sure, sure. Please jump in. I can't on my iPhone can't see all of you at once. So I please see. jump Thank in. Thank you. Stephen, this is a this is a really excellent point uh, and very dear to my heart. So um, just to clarify, uh, the lessons of history history more actually in the sense of the lessons from my own personal recent experience is what I was talking about um, because. In my research, I found that ordinary Americans were very articulate in writing to their elected officials about how they understood World War II, which was either a few months ago or a few years ago in the, in the source collection that I looked at in the Truman Library, um, how they understood World War II. And of course, that was shaped by their own experience. And they were saying this back in a critique of um, the official lesson learned from history, which was the, the famous anti-appeasement Munich lesson. So that was my point. And I think something, a similar dynamic is going on in, um, in what uh, Professor von Eschen describes, um, that this was grounded in Mandela's and Gorbachev's and, uh, and Václav Havel, and maybe most interesting, Gorbachev's experience as a political leader. Like all these things, all these ideological things that I grew up with on which we founded a whole country, it's not working. So we, ha we have to change. So I think these are uh, lessons learned the hard way. Um, and I completely agree with you and sort of based on experience. And I completely agree with you, Steve, that um, that when historians put out, you know, lessons learned, although mostly it's lessons not learned, but here they are. Here's what, you know, they should have learned. You are quite right. Um, and, you know, I hope that I acknowledge that in the beginning, um, none of us are free <laughs> from bits and pieces of ideological thinking. And we have to be, you know, what, what uh, Professor Dujak so rightly, um, I think, or, or, or Penny um, remarked upon as, you know, maybe we need a little bit more national self-interrogation. Uh, that is true for authors and scholars, historians and pundits as well. I completely agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? like to respond to that question. I have one thought there, um, just, just to weigh in. You know, I think uh, there might have been some slippage in the terms we were using, but I think all of us were talking actually about the way the historical actors leveraged the lessons that they learned from their own studies of the past. So, you know, uh, very often, for instance, I've been really struck in my recent public talks, for instance, about the America First Committee. You know, if you go through their records, the single most important historical event for the America First Committee is uh, the process by which the U.S. got into World War One, and you will see, you know, the lessons of World War One again and again and again and again in the America First Committee's writings, their public pamphlets, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and you can find this in other in other forms. When I've studied the isolationism, for instance, one of the constituent parts of isolationist ideas, I argue, is a historicist vision of how Washington, Jefferson, and Monroe can be updated for a given period of time. So they understand this history and then they adapt it for another era. Well, Washington would have said no to NATO uh, because no entangling alliances um, and that sort of thing. So I think you're right to be cautious. And if there was some slippage in how we were talking about it, that isn't, um, I don't think, accurate to how we've written about it and studied this. And then there is, of course, as Michaela was saying, I think it's very important. Uh, historians in the public, we very often say, here are some historical insights that we could learn from that we have not learned from. Um, and and it's um, it, it's a it may be a Sisyphus like task, but a lot of us are rolling that rock up the hill as much as we can. Right. Thank if you. I jump in and say, um, if I'm hearing this right, also that there was an element that Michaela spoke to about historians um, interrogating their own assumptions and being aware of that. Um, we could also relate this to a question from Arlene Fleming, who said, what's the relationship between ideology and mythology? Um, for example, the myth of American exceptionalism. And um, I'll just start briefly by tying those together and say, I mean, my answer would be to that, that the, to me, I mean, the heart of the, the I would start with the definition of ideology that says ideology, in, ideology posits something that is actually created, um, created by humans, it, it, 
is um, it claims that something is timeless and natural, which is in fact not natural, but you know, created within historical time by humans. And it, it's that kind of confusion that that presents both ideology and mythology. And um, so, in some sense, you know, they're just deeply tied. And I think. But the other thing I would say, and I think we always have to interrogate our own assumptions, but that not all ideologies or not all worldviews are, they're not all equal and they're not all equally flawed because they're not all equally insistent that their own view is is correct and timeless and natural. Some some worldviews are far more humble in their, you know, they they question the limits, the, the, you know, the limits of their own knowledge or their own epistemology. So I think as scholars, we have to always be questioning what we're bringing to the table and what our own assumptions are. But of course, nobody can operate without assumptions. But I think that's the whole work of um, of sort of. This is why I think history is very much like ideological critique because historians are in the business. When somebody says this is natural and timeless, we say, "Uh, uh-uh, no, it's not. <laughs> this is this is when it was. This is how it was created and when, and this is how it happened. And these were the struggles and contest over it. So I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. But I just I really liked that question and thought it tied into the last um, conversation. Great, thanks. Thanks, Penny. But I do have a question for you, just in follow up. Give an example for our audience of a more humble ideology, as you just put it. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. So um, a more so yeah, and what I would I call it an ideology. A, a more, I guess, a more humble um, a more humble ideology would be um, it would be to say um, um, that. I guess, and, and I'm wary of jumping to the word pragmatic, but I think it would be kind of an experiential based sense of learning and that that is more or less, you know, compatible with a maybe just pragmatism in a philosophical sense that would that would say that um, we have um, um, we, so that that I that this is. This, this, my hypothesis, I think this is the relationship between using fossil fuel and the climate, but we're going to, we're going to try, you know, we're going to, we're going to do an experiment, we're going to test this out. A, 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 something that's open to um, being falsified, or a sort of something that is, you know, I, or like, Think this is going to help the person, but rather than say, you know, this is the only, you know, that um, we're, yeah, this is the only thing we can do. Um, yeah, I guess the political analogy, you know, the political examples might be a little bit, you know, a little bit, you know, easier to contrast because somebody who is saying, you know, um, you know who says 70% of the people may not, um, you know, may not um, be agree with um, abolishing abortion in all instances, but I'm, but we know we're right and we're going to impose this on people by any means necessary under any circumstances where you go to a very totalitarian, totalitarian view. Anyway, that was, that was uh, not very helpful, but. Thank, thank you. Um, all right. We have another question from Stanley Ezrell. Stanley. Can you hear me now, I hope? Yes. I am a 1971 graduate of Columbia University. Um, and I have been sort of an amateur, I guess, in the area of how does ideology affect policy um, with, you know, particularly doing, a, and I don't want to go too much into this, but the particularly going into how it was that the remnants of the Confederacy were scraped together and used in order to organize the way that um, academics and others thought about and influenced the ideology of the United States, and particularly since the end of the Second World War, um, we had one very tragic situation, which was the death of FDR before the end of the war. And what he was replaced by consistently are things that just do not 
have the same idea of the United States as a, um, a model for the entire world, model for you know, what we do to build our own people, the equality and what we do to, you know, to make sure that the United, you know, that the United States runs and the things associated with the good neighbor policy of FDR. Um, so your question, your question, my question is this, I want, I, and I just said that to, you know, so you get some idea of my background. Right now, we have a situation in the world, which is probably the most perilous we've ever been in. And, you know, oddly, in the election campaigns, leading candidates and so on, you rarely, if ever, heard the question, what are we going to do about preventing nuclear war? We didn't hear it today in this discussion. Um, and, you know, I would just, you know, put it, you know, in a, in a way where it's sort of obvious what you're talking about. You, you know, look at our Secretary of State, our Secretary of War, look at the President. What you hear is the phrase rules-based order not the U.S. Constitution, not the United yes. States, not the United Nations um, documents. Give your question, Stanley, I'm sorry. My, my question is, what do you see in terms of the fact that the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, have essentially been scrapped by our current leadership as part of our ideology and replaced by this idea, which is basically whatever we say we're gonna do. And one more point on that when you, see, you know, look at it is that right now the non-aligned nations and the whole non-aligned movement of nations has been reassembling. There was a week long conference in- yeah, really, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Stanley, we, we have uh, other people who'd like to join. Let me, let me- Cut oh, you off there. Tell me what you think about all of that and why you've oh, been so apologies, reluctant. but we have, I think, a clear understanding of your question. Um, uh, who'd like to respond? Um, my go-to will be uh, Chris is the general editor, but any of you, um, Penny, Michaela, uh, Mary, feel free to join. I see Michaela, and I'm, I'm curious to know what, what other folks have to say. I have thoughts, but... All right. I'll Michaela. just start. Very briefly, because there was so much in what Stanley said that really resonates quite deeply with me. And um, this is not, um, uh, I can't think of the right word right now, but I don't want to make a simple advertisement for this book, but the answer to your questions um, are actually in this are actually in this book. It's it's really quite amazing, you know, having read uh, across it. Um, I I, I want to tie this to Professor Duchak's important question about causality, ideas, ideologies, and politics, and interests and motivations, and so on. Um, and I don't have an answer for that, but the image that came to my mind, the metaphor, was ideas and ideologies uh, as dolphins. Now you see them, now you don't see them. And, um, and so it's sort of the multidirectional uh, dimension of you know ideas and the realities that they shape and how that goes back and forth. And also Chris's important point in his unilateralism piece uh, in this chapter that something does not need to be a coherent ideology. And I think as the chapters show across the board, uh, that's kind of a distinctive feature of an ideology that it is incoherent. Otherwise it wouldn't work, right? Because it has to persuade a lot of people uh, with different interests. And that's why, you know, it's it's completely, it's it's all it's always at odds with each other. Um and I just want to sort of add on to still a little bit in response to Stanley's um remark, um something that that Penny's comments made me uh made me think of, namely, um, you know, maybe I, I was trained as a historian of Nazi Germany before I became a US foreign policy historian. So totalitarianism and also just the experience of a totalitarian dictatorship, you know, uh, and the genocide that it produced, the multiple genocides that it produced um, are always very central to my historical thinking. So uh, this totalizing aspect that Penny rightly keeps foregrounding is very important to me. And I just want to 
uh, remind everyone, as sort of historians, we're not talking a lot about it because it's uh, other colleagues have written so extensively and beautifully about it, Wilson. Um, so I think in terms of, so the, the Wilsonian ideology, what, you know, motivated him and, and how that um, produced World War I. And I think that Chris's people are so right to keep obsessing about World War I because it, it, it was consensually regarded as a huge mistake by the Europeans, you know, by Americans, uh, a great slaughter that solved absolutely nothing. So, I mean, you know, they're America firsters, okay, but, you know, I think that they're also reasonable and rational people in obsessing about that. Um, so Wilsonianism, um, I think, I think the, what, the way it manifests and works in the political realm in the world, nationally and internationally, has a very strong totalizing dimension. And that's reflected in Wilson's brain, actually. And yet there are these aspects of, you know, self-determination and, and, and others, including the liberal international order, um, which were, again, in line with what Stanley just said, completely distorted, you know, uh, right away by Wilson, who said, well, of course not for colored people. You know, I was talking about the Central Europeans here in terms of self-determination. But uh, I think Stanley's point is well taken. Um, so the transition from Roosevelt to Truman is huge and dramatic. And in my view, in my personal view, just like Stanley, I think it was a break, you know, it was a real ideological shift that happened there. Um, so the liberal international order that, you know, Wilson is always credited for, liberal internationalism, it starts there, but it, you know, it begins manifesting very differently after 45. But like self-determination, as Eris Manella has shown, um, these ideas do get picked up by other people. And they take the ball and run in another direction that is completely contrary to U.S. foreign policy interests and, and ideologies. But, you know, that's the beauty of ideas. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to um, call on one more um, audience member. Um, uh, so uh, rather, I hope, Chris, you, you'll forgive me for not calling on you uh, right away. Perhaps you can wrap your comments into your final comments. Stephanie Kinney. Uh, if you'd like to pose your question or comment. Uh, yes, I uh, I sent it in uh, as a as a question, and it was I'm struck by the long lived roots of traditional religion into the 21st century, even as they contest with ideological secular religions and their political manifestations. And I wonder if we run the risk of relegating religion, uh, traditional religion, too much to the past um, as we focus on ideology, which is a kind of religion in, in many instances of its own. Thanks very much. Who'd like to respond to this? It'll probably be our final. I see, I see Penny, and I'm happy to wrap up. I want to, yeah, sure. really quickly. Um, I wish we had a lot of time to discuss this, but I, I think we have to be relentlessly historical, and we can't talk. There's no such thing about as traditional religion coming in the present or continuing to live in the present. Every form of religion we know of has been radically reshaped by the politics of the the time it's in. If we look at the radical reshaping of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and with over, let's just take the last of the arc of the last 50 to 60 years or the period in which the book covers. So that's, I think, you know, historic religion has to be as radically historicized as anything else. And I'm so sorry we can't talk about this for hours, but we can't. So over to Chris. <laughs> I, I totally you. agree with that. And I think it's a great question. I teach a, a pretty popular class on religion and U.S. foreign relations. And it's a it's a through line in the book, the role of religion in shaping ideology and, and shaping um, very many and diverse groups of Americans thought. Right. Uh, because it's this religious ideology is um, or religion can inflect all sorts of different ideologies and religion can be manif uh, manifested and um, 
deployed for particular kinds of ends. You see this, you know, historically in 1898, you have religious groups on either side of questions about whether or not the U.S. should an annex territory. And I would add one more thought as we sort of conclude, you know, one of the ways in which, and I was opening with Charlottesville, you know, one of the ways in which we get nor normalized and, and, and have um, sort of experiential ways in which uh, ideology and, and forms of religion can be um, commingled uh, is things like civil religion. So you think to the to the Cold War and you think to the ways in which under Eisenhower, you wind up with, you know, under God and the pledge and on money and, and the kinds of practices that you see at college football games of sort of worshiping the flag. Right. And, and a veteran of the day and all this sort of stuff. It's so normalized that when I pointed out to college students, they sometimes say, like, I had no idea that it wasn't always this way. Right. And sort of civil religion is a great way of thinking about um, the many kinds of manifestations, because civil religion has also been operationalized by people like Colin Kaepernick to object to, uh, you know, the 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 uh, carceral state to in interventions abroad to all sorts of forms of inequality right so you can use these same kinds of religious and civil religious ideas in very different forms and different um, orientations and as penny said constantly being updated i mean one of the things we find in this book is ideologies are almost never static and to to mary dujak's point right it's like nailing jelly to a wall right when you've got it you're there and you think you've really found uh, exactly what's going on, that ideology shifts with different geopolitical circumstances and different domestic circumstances. And so I think that's why it's such a fruitful area to study and think about and think with and through. Because if you look at foreign relations through the lens of ideology, it really changes how you think about foreign relations. And one interesting takeaway there is that it shows just how deeply commingled domestic and foreign policy are. On that note, and on Penny's point that we could have uh, gone on for quite some time with this discussion, let me thank our panelists. Uh, congratulations again on the book, Chris, on a prize, and uh, Michaela, Penny, Mary, and of course, Eric. Thank you so much for this terrific conversation. Back to Eric for concluding remarks. And my thanks to everyone as well, including uh, Mary's very, very cute dog. Uh, I appreciate it its presence. So in drawing the session to a close, let me remind you that the Washington History Seminar returns next Monday, November 21st at 4 p.m. for an AHA-sponsored session on a new book by Philippa Strum, On Account of Sex, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and the Making of Gender Equality Law, with the author and discussant Deborah Archer, the president of the ACLU and professor of law at NYU. Till then, take care, be safe, and good night. Thank you, everyone.